everybody. It's Monday, May 9th, and that means it's time for another episode of Nonprofit Conversations. I'm your host, Cecilia Sepp. I'm the principal and founder of Rape Tulips Consulting. This is our first episode without our longtime co-host, Agnes Amos Coleman. We wish her all the best in her new endeavors. And on behalf of Agnes, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience, and thanks for joining us this week. We're really excited to have yet another first-time guest as we continue our first-time guest trend this year, Lizra Fabian, who's the Executive Director of the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce. Welcome, Lizra. Would you like to say hello to our audience and introduce yourself and tell us a little about you? Well, thank you so much for having me on this program, and I'm delighted to represent my island, represent my country, and the different networks that I'm a part of. I'm from Dominica, the nature isle of the Caribbean, between Martinique and Guadeloupe in that area, if you consider in geography. And I'm also a supporter of the private sector. I've been working in private sector development for the past um, 10 years. So I'm really delighted to share with you some of the lessons and experiences that I've learned over the years. That's great, Lisa, and you really do have a lot to bring. As we were talking, as we were prepping for the episode, you really have like a three-tiered involvement in many networks. So first of all, your work with the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce, which uh, I do want to say, uh, Lisa has already mentioned, it's an island nation. Uh, it is not the same as the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Dominican Republic is also part of an island, but it's not the same one. So... But uh, the, the thing is, Lisa, you're involved in this network of businesses and industries on the island of Dominica. You're also part of a regional wide network called Cari Cham, Cari Cham. And then you're also part of a UN network of organizations around the world that help people with disaster preparation and risk management in those areas of disaster prep. So we have a lot to uh, discuss about collaboration partnerships and how associations can help each other by leveraging their relationships. So let's start locally where you live. Uh, so in Dominica, how do you see the businesses within your association helping each other through the, their partnerships and their relationships? Well, that's a, a very good question because in Dominica, we have businesses from different sectors who are part of the chamber. So we have from telecoms to agriculture, manufacturing, services, and businesses who operate in these sectors, collaborating with each other, sharing best practices, we've seen that they've been able to enhance their businesses. So next week, we'll be having one of the events we call the membership networking event. And at that event, that member who we're focusing on will be able to share about their business. So we have similar type of events and activities at our chamber where members get to share some of the best practices. We have general events where they come on, such as with disaster risk reduction. We're doing the tabletop exercise and there the larger businesses as well as the smaller businesses both get to share on how they've been enhancing their businesses. Well, that sounds like a great uh, program, and that's something that we can relate to in the United States as well, and I'm sure other countries around the world is, first of all, just getting everybody together in the room and sharing that information. So taking it up to that next level of your involvement region-wide in the Caribbean, or Caribbean, I know some people say it uh, different ways. So in that region, do you do similar things across the Caribbean where you're bringing the different businesses or organizations together in that manner? So we started Caricham, which is a network of Caribbean Chambers of Commerce in 2019. We started with 16 chambers and by 2020, well, the start of 2020, we worked up to 21 chambers of commerce in 20 countries. And we saw that this network was not existing before. There was a gap and a need to bring together chambers of commerce within the Caribbean. We focused on four key areas and these areas really helped us to strengthen our collaboration. So we focus on disaster risk reduction, which is a pillar that I lead personally. We also focus on membership value and advocacy, how we could continue to advocate for the, the chambers, but also consider the needs of all members. We also look at best practice and knowledge sharing, which is key to what we're also discussing, understanding where chambers are strong. And in some areas, some of our chambers are not as strong. 
So these chambers were strong, really get to help us to understand how to enhance our capacity in these areas, how to learn from the mistakes that they've made, and even maybe advocacy points that they're sharing with the governments, maybe what we could consider in our countries. And the final one is on trade facilitation, trade promotion, and transportation. So within the Caribbean region, yes, we are striving towards an economic union for at least some of the countries in the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and some of the, the chambers who are part of this network are not part of that community. But it also helps us to understand how to improve our trade relations, how to advocate better, and how to represent our businesses in the most optimal way. So we've seen through this network, it's really helped us to not just on a local level collaborate, but across over 20 countries, really enhance and, and learn more so that we can um, smoothen out the relationship challenges or, or, the, or the trade related issues that our members would be facing and enhance our region as a whole. That is amazing growth that you have that many members just since 2019. So congratulations on that. Uh, that is really a wonderful example of pulling people together. Uh, you mentioned some- one more thing with you on that in terms of oh, this. Oh, sure. We represent over 100,000 businesses. So that's just a little bit more context. Um, for some countries, it's mandatory that they are part of the chamber. Um, in some of our other countries, it's voluntary, like in Dominica, but mm -hmm. we represent over 100,000 businesses. So you have 21 chambers of commerce that represent 100,000 businesses. Yes. In, in some countries, it's a few tens of thousands. So like Suriname, it's a really big network where they represent all businesses in Suriname. So mm -hmm. that one for sure is one of our biggest, our biggest chambers. That is incredible that, that there are that many businesses in one chamber network. I, I am just, I'm, I used to work at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce at the very beginning of my career. And so they represented you know, businesses all over the United States. But of course, it, you know, it was voluntary. Uh, you did mention some of the countries, they they require it. Uh, so what, in, in that instance, though, that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, question. So do you know why some of the countries require the membership in the chamber? Well, I think it's based on the, the history of the country as well. So mm -hmm. for Suriname operating based on the Dutch um, sort of history because we have the anglophone countries where it's more of the democratic um, type of society and um, the government is elected in a specific way. I think it's similar for Caribbean like CARICOM countries, but where you have the chambers in Martinique and Guadeloupe, they must also represent the, the businesses in the country and they have that relationship with the government where they are responsible for representing the private sector. They're responsible for registration of all businesses. Um, but in our other countries, the government takes on part of the, the registration rule and we support um, by voluntarily bringing together the businesses. Um, the businesses um, decide who they want to be the board of directors and um, I'm representing as the executive director of my chamber. So I'm employed to support the board and the, the membership. So it's, it's different based on the structure of the country, the historical relations. I see. So the, and, and in those instances, the chamber plays a, a little bit different role because they're almost part of the, the representative government system. So, oh, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. You, you also mentioned, I want to go back to something else you mentioned a few minutes ago. You, you mentioned disaster preparation and, and getting ready for that. So in your region, what sort of disasters might uh, your members in Dominica or within your wider CARICOM network have to prepare for? Okay, well, it's interesting that you, you asked that question. So in Dominica and in the Caribbean, and um, we're prone to different sets of hazards and, and risks. And one of the things I must mention that risks are not just natural, um, it's not just like, you know, hurricanes or, or this type of activities, but we have the pandemic and that's one of the, the risks that we're all faced with across the world. But based on where we're located, hurricanes seem to be quite prevalent, especially for Dominica. Um, mm -hmm. Every June to November, we have to consider ensuring that we have everything in place as much as possible to mitigate the disaster. So to ensure that it doesn't affect us, not just preparing for it to happen, but minimizing our risk as much as possible. 
and then ensuring that in case something happens, how do we recover as quickly as possible? That's, um, I didn't want to assume, but I thought that would be probably a major in the top three things yes, you yes. would have to be disaster ready for, which would be the hurricane season in yes, that part yes. of the world. So what are some of the things that you advise your members to do uh, to get ready for that? Uh, you know, it's going to come every year. You know, it's always going to be a hurricane season. Some are better than others. But so what are some of the things that you might uh, remind your members to do, whether it's uh, making sure you have a backup of your database or, or uh, other things like copies of your documents? Like what are some of the things that a business might have to do during that period of the year? Great. So even before we come to that point and all during the year, we encourage our businesses to complete their business continuity plans because mm -hmm. in completing that plan, we'll be able to identify some of the same things you mentioned, ensuring we back up our data, ensuring that we have um, generators if it's necessary, it depends on the type of business, also mm -hmm. depends on the type of risk. We're able to develop strategies that really helps that business to mitigate the risk. So backing up data online for sure, because if in case something happens, a flood takes place or the building is destroyed, then the data can be recovered because it's accessible virtually. It's also important to consider the, the, the human resource. So the employees looking at vulnerable people, um, ensuring that the customers can also access information. So how we communicate with our customers, that is also quite vital. I must mention that because um, it's within the last 24 hours. So Courage Ham, we created this business um, resilience toolkit which is to support the businesses across the Caribbean and any other business who wants to use it, it's free open source and someone can download it and use it to complete the business continuity plan. Last night, we held a session, the Chamber DAIC together with the, the International Organization for Migration for Haitian Entrepreneurs in Dominica. So what we realize is that migrant entrepreneurs and migrants, of course, they are one of the most vulnerable parts of our society. And mm -hmm. if they are not resilient, then our countries are not resilient because they live, they reside in our countries. Mm -hmm. So we held a session to support the Haitian entrepreneurs. And as part of the Karacham Business Resilience Toolkit, the BCP guide and template has been translated into Haitian Creole, Dutch, French, and Spanish. So we have five languages. So if anyone is listening, they can access it via CaribbeanChambers.net. And when they get on the site, they just look for business continuity planning or business resilience toolkit, and they're able to download the resources and use it to enhance the resilience. That is a, such a valuable resource. And I just really appreciate that you share that for no fee, because that a, a business continuity plan is something we all could use whether we're for-profit or non-profit. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that. that. That's a great resource. Uh, and could you say the website one more time in case people want to download it? Sure. It's CaribbeanChambers.net, CaribbeanChambers.net. And great. this is a Paricham website. And there are different tabs that individuals could go on. And this one is specific to business resilience. And there's the, the different documents, the guide, the template. We've also created videos to guide persons in looking at the videos to help them to understand much more easily um, how to go through the process. That's wonderful. What a great service. I think that is a great idea for all nonprofits to model is providing that kind of a useful tool to their members and to their network. So yes, thank yes. you for setting that example. And it's hard to believe we're coming close to the end of our episode already. I could talk to you for another two hours, I'm sure. Yes, uh, yes. I find this all so interesting. I do, though, before we sign off for this week, uh, I do want to ask you to talk a little bit about the Global Arise Network that you're involved with, because you're involved locally, regionally, and you're also involved internationally. And I think that's an important message to get out. So could you tell us a little bit about that group, too? Great, I can. Um, so the Arise Global Network is the United Nation Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies. And in any country, someone or group of, of individuals or an organization can decide to join this network. It's a voluntary commitment to apply to the, the Sendai framework. And the Sendai framework looks at how we reduce our risk. 
we reduce mortality, we reduce the number of persons affected, we reduce the loss, economic losses, but we also ensure that we have disaster or, or plans, resilient plans, and we ensure that we enhance our collaboration and partnership for building resilience. And that's part of what the, the main aim of Arise is about. We also focus on strengthening the resilience of SMEs. We look at the small and medium enterprises. We also look at building and having innovative solutions for insurance, risk-informed investments, and resilient infrastructure. These are the four main areas that we're looking at. So there are different networks around the world, in the Caribbean, of course, the Americas and the Caribbean, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, so in the US as well. So there's a US Arise and Canada Arise. So there are many Arise networks around the world. I think over 200 um, organizations and businesses and organizations who have subscribed to the network. There's also the website, which is Arise Global Network where someone can learn more about it. But through this network, we come onto this platform, we're able to share our best practices, share what we're doing in our countries, um, collaborate on events and activities together. And interestingly, in three weeks, we will begin the global platform for disaster risk reduction, where Arise Networks will be part of it. This year it's in Bali, and I'll be supporting um, at that event representing our network, representing DAIC, representing Caricham to share some of our best practices. So this is what we do as the, the Arise Network. We support the UN structure, but also help to increase resilience for businesses across the world. And you've, first of all, I, I, I'll admit, uh, and I'm a little embarrassed, I was not familiar at all with the Arise Network, uh, Arise Global Network. Yeah, yeah. It, so now I am. So thank you for that. Uh, the UN does a lot of great work that is really not well known. And I think this is one of those examples. Uh, the United Nations does do a lot to help people and help uh, societies grow and stay strong. Uh, we, we need to, 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 to do our sign off, unfortunately. But Lisa, you have mentioned many times through our conversation today, resilience. And we always like to ask our guests to leave our audience with a final thought. Uh, we don't usually ask a specific question for the final thought, but this time I'm going to. So you've talked a lot about resilience for individuals, for societies, for communities, for businesses, and, and for the networks around the world you're involved with. So when you when you talk about resilience, what are what are some of the things that it means to you when, when you talk about that? When I speak about resilience, I speak about being able to operate as fully as possible and as quickly as possible after any interruption to our business or our organization. So for different businesses and organizations, it could mean different things. That's why it's important that someone really understand what they're looking for. But we really encourage like for businesses to be able to provide their products and services in the shortest space of time. So if it's something that individuals need, it's a real critical need of that the customers coming back up five months later may not mean that it's as resilient. But if someone is able to come up in a few days, um, sometimes in a few hours, then that means that that business is working towards resilience. That's a great, great definition of resilience. Thank you. And then I, I asked you that question. Did you have another thought you would like the audience to take away today? And then if they would like to follow up with you on any of these amazing programs that you are involved with, and I am not a person who uses the word amazing loosely, that I am very impressed with you, your leadership, and all of these different organizations that you're involved with. So thank you again for being here. So what is the thought you would like the audience to leave with and how could they get in touch with you if they wanted to talk to you more? Great, well, the, the final thought I would leave and even based on our discussion here is that collaboration is key. We really cannot do it by ourselves. So whether it's associations coming together, whether it's individuals or businesses coming together, we need to find some common ground because if we come together, we can achieve a lot more. Um, I encourage everyone that if they want to reach out to us, they can reach out to Caricham at caribbeanchambers.net or for DAIC, Dominica Chamber, 
www.lizrafabian.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also available, Lizra Fabian, if someone wants to reach out directly. But we're available to collaborate and support and, and share our best practices with anyone who desires to reach out to us. Thank you so much, Lisa. You have been a wonderful guest and you have brought so much information in a short amount of time. And one of the goals of our show is to uh, educate people and introduce them to people like yourself. Uh, so thank you. And uh, hopefully uh, you will come back to the show in the future and we can discuss some of the other programs. That's great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this this uh, conversation this week has been with Lisa Fabian. Executive Director of the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce, and so much more. She is contributing a lot in the world. So thank you for that, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we have to go rogue for now, uh, but we'll be back next week with another exciting episode of Nonprofit Conversations. Uh, but in the meantime, make sure you subscribe. We're on a variety of platforms. We're on Anchor, Spotify, Apple, Google, and Amazon Music, just to name a few. So don't miss an episode. Uh, we're in audio and video format. So however you like to learn, we're there. If you'd like to learn more about Rogue Tulips Consulting, check out our website, roguetulips.com. If you're interested in CAE education and preparation for the CAE exam, Check out the 501C League, our education program at the501cleague.net. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>